Good morning, Harefield Church. Great to be with you. Uh, I'm recording this at All Nations Christian College in my classroom, uh, so I feel very much at home. Uh, just up the road, about five miles away from where the church building is located. But it's very exciting uh, to be gathered together from across Harlow, uh, across Essex and Hertfordshire, but maybe also that we have people that would be from around the world seeing this later on on YouTube. So we are uh, a local, but perhaps even a, a global community. So very exciting to be a part of that. And as we look both locally and around the world, one of the things that I notice, especially during this pandemic season, is that people's horizons are getting shorter and shorter. The way that we plan, the way that we look ahead has changed for many of us. Some of us are struggling to look beyond a day, beyond a week and beyond a month. And one of the things that I find the Lord encouraging me to do and others during this season is, and I've got the title there on the screen, to keep looking beyond. Keep looking to the horizon, to stretch out our vision and not to become boxed in either physically or mentally in terms of time and space. So we just keep looking into the future. And one of the best ways that we can do this is by looking at Revelation 21, which is one of my favorite passages at this time. And hopefully you will see that as we go through. You'll see why that is true for me. So if you've got your Bibles with you, either on a device or you've got a, a physical Bible with you, uh, let's read that together. And I'm just going to read Revelation 21. So I'll give you a second just to get there. Revelation 21. And I'm just going to read the whole chapter because I think it's phenomenal. And uh, I think it's very exciting for us to do that. So are you ready? I'm going to start at verse one. Here we go. And it says that John, he says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth. They were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Wow, fantastic. And God shall wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain for the former things have passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, right, for these words are true and faithful. Verse six. And he said unto me, it is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcomes will inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars, they will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And there came unto me, says John, one of the seven angels, which had seven vials full of the seven last plagues. And he talked with me, saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and a high mountain. He showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God having the glory of God, and her light was like under stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And it had a wall great and high and 12 gates, and at the gates were 12 angels, and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. On the east, there were three gates. On the north, there were three gates. On the south, there were three gates. And on the west, 
there were three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden rod to measure the city, and the gates thereof, and the wall thereof as well. And the city like four square. And the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with that reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it were equal. And he measured the wall thereof, 144 cubits, according to the measure of the man, that is, of the angel. And the building of the wall was of jasper, and the city was pure gold unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, and the eighth beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophos, and eleventh a jacinth, the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God lightened it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth, they will bring glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall be no ways into it anything that defiles, neither that which works abominations or lies, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. Hallelujah. And there shall be no more cross, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants will serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be in their foreheads. And there will be no night there, and no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. Wow, Father, we just thank you for this incredible vision. And in the time that we have, Father, I pray that you will impress this upon our hearts. But also make it clear in our minds that which you have destined for us in jesus name amen so there we have a beautiful picture bringing to an end this incredible book of revelation and the question that it begs and i stole this from dallas willard apparently this is a question that he also has asked in some of his writings the question is this, not where will you be in a day's time or a week's time or a month's time or a year's time, but where are you going to be in 500 years time? Let's get serious. Let's really stretch out the horizon. And I don't know whether you've ever thought about it in that way before. Where will you be in 500 years time? And actually, Revelation very clearly <laughs> describes what the options might be. If Jesus has come back by that time, by the time 500 years is up, there are actually two choices. For those that don't know Jesus, those that are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and this is in chapter 20, just before chapter 21 that we read, they will actually be cast into the lake of fire. Those with no relationship with God, no acknowledgement of God, who don't know Jesus, they will be cast into the lake of fire having been judged for their works. But for those that know Jesus and that are written in the Lamb's book of life, well, then Revelation 21 becomes true for them. And so there's actually a choice here, and I put it on the screen. We're either going to live in the promise of God, which is the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth, or we're going to live under the penalty of God and be cast into the lake of fire. What is our choice? 
What is our choice? We're making many choices at the moment and many choices are being made for us. But actually in the midst of everything that is going on, actually the most important choice is the choice for Jesus. Because in eternity, that is going to make the absolute difference. So where will you be in 500 years time? And there's a commentator, Moffat, he puts this very well. Well, you could be in the smoke and the pain and the heat of chapter 20, which is just before what I read. But you could also be a relief to pass into the clear, clean atmosphere of the eternal morning where the breath of heaven is sweet and the vast city of God sparkles like a diamond in the radiance of his presence. Wow, what a contrast. And I think that's why chapter 20 goes before chapter 21, because it brings out that contrast. Where will you be in 500 years time? If you were going to divide up this chapter, this might be the pattern or this might be the structure that you would get out of that. What we've just looked at from the end of chapter 20 is the penalty of God. But actually, what chapter 21 and the beginning of 22 are talking about is three Ps. It talks about the presence of God, both at the beginning and end of that section. It talks about the people of God. Again, a little bit tighter in the middle of this passage, and right in the center, the largest part of this passage, it talks about the place of God. And so it brings together those two ideas. You've got the penalty of God, which we've dealt with. But now we look at the presence of God, the people of God in the place of God. Before we look at the parousia, which is just a posh word ready for Jesus's return, until we look at the second coming of Jesus in chapter 22. So it's a beautifully structured passage. So let's look at that. How does it start? Well, in chapter 21, the first few verses there, everything is new. And I don't know if you can imagine being John and standing there and just seeing everything that is going on. It's just incredible. The whole sort of universe is in transition. There's a new heaven and a new earth. And it must be just incredible to witness this transition, this momentous, massive transition. And through John's eyes, we get to see what that is going to look like. Everything is new. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. Praise the Lord. And as that's coming, actually, what you get is the final covenant. What does it say in chapter three? It says, Behold, now the, the tabernacle or the dwelling of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God will be with them and be their God. And this is like the final covenant. There's been many, many covenants up to this point in the Bible. You've got the covenant that God made with Noah and with Moses and with David and with Abraham. You've got the new covenant that is in Jesus. And now you've got this final covenant, which is like bringing all of those things together, where we get to dwell permanently and fully in the presence of God as a new community. So what you have is the final covenant in verse three, but actually what it describes is an incredible new community in heaven. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. What happens in that place? Well, it's described for us like this. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death shall be no more. Neither will there be any more mourning or crying or pain because those things have gone. They will have ceased. The characteristics of this community is it's tear-free, death-free, sorrow-free, and pain-free. And I have to say, as I look on my television right now or read on the news on my computer, this sounds incredible because I don't think I've ever been quite so close to a situation of tears, death, and pain as we are experiencing at the moment. Everything is very front and center to us. But in this new place to where we're headed, those things have gone. Those things 
have passed. This must be an encouragement to us this morning. What else is there about that place? You know, when we get to the new heaven, the new earth and the new Jerusalem, no longer will we feel insecure. I don't know if you ever feel insecure. My goodness, probably every day I have a moment of insecurity. Do I enjoy that? Is that a comfortable feeling? Absolutely not. Is there a day that goes by where I don't worry about something? Is there a day that goes by where I'm not slightly fearful about something that's happening around me? But actually, this place to where we're headed, there's no insecurity. Imagine that feeling. No feeling of insecurity, nothing to worry about. I have that actually to be true and have nothing to fear. And just imagine what that's going to be looking like, how that's going to feel. It's absolutely tremendous. And I'm looking forward to those days that will stretch into eternity. It says there will be no more curse. This is now in chapter 22. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants, which is us, who know Jesus and who will be in this place, we will serve him. And that will be a joy and that will be a delight. I know many of us, we, ha we sometimes we think, well, when we get to heaven, we'll be able to just rest. And you will. We will rest together. But out of that rest, we will serve the Lord. And it will be a joy and a delight for us to do that. And they will see his face. We will see his face and his name will be on our foreheads. We will be marked and we will belong to God face to face. We will enjoy that complete presence. Sometimes we talk in church, don't we? Uh, we sense the presence of God in that place. Or sometimes at home when you're praying, sometimes you sense the presence of God. That can be anywhere. But here you're going to experience that presence in its absolute fullness. And that is going to be amazing. The little touches that we get of the presence of God already uh, are almost overwhelming. But when we receive that in its fullness and enjoy that in its fullness, wow, that is going to be an amazing future. So from the presence of God, we move into the place of God. And this is where the angel, the angel, uh, a few chapters back, who's been destroying the old earth and bringing God's curses onto the earth, now shows a completely different picture to John. John, up to this point, has been kind of looking from the ground up at whatever's been going on. And the angel gives him a new perspective, takes him up onto a mountain so that he can see everything that is going on. And it's a repeat here. It says, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Praise the Lord. That's going to be incredible. The one who had orchestrated global destruction in chapter 16 now helps John to behold this creative masterpiece of the new Jerusalem descending out of the skies with the new heaven to the new earth. He's got a better vantage point this time, though, than what he had earlier. What you see is the perfect city, the bride, the lamb's wife, the church, if you like. And what does that represent? It represents a place, but also God's presence. So God's presence and this place are kind of fused together, together with God's people. So the presence, the place, and the people are together, as it were, in this picture of the new Jerusalem. And that's exactly what God has always intended for us, for the presence of God, in the place of God, with the people of God. And that, my friends, is what heaven, the new heaven, the new earth, and the new Jerusalem is going to look like. It's going to bring all of those three perfectly together. What a thing to look forward to. I don't know about you, but if you've ever bought a house, sometimes, I, I, how, how to say this, Sometimes the estate agents uh, are known to uh, exaggerate, perhaps, 
some of the characteristics of the the house that they're trying to sell to you. And what you have, I, I found this great website on the BBC website. It's called Estate Agents Speak a Dictionary. And I just encourage you, if you want to have a laugh, go and have a look at that. And some really funny things on that. But what I thought was, well, let me take some of those out and just show you this morning. So I, I love this. Uh, how about an internal viewing recommended? What does that actually mean? It means it looks awful on the outside. So actually, you do better when you go in. I love this. Uh, a, a house was described in this way. It has a multi-vehicular block pavia driveway parking facility. Uh, what does that mean? It just meant it had a large drive. I quite like that one. And then this, this was my favorite. There are others on there. Go and have a look. Uh, studio. It means you can wash the dishes, watch the telly and answer the front door without actually getting up from the toilet. <laughs> I, I thought that was funny. I thought that was good. And and in a sense, when we sell properties to one another, there's a there's a tendency, obviously, to exaggerate. But what we have here is a description of a place in its totality with absolutely no exaggeration. What you're going to see here is exactly what you're going to get. Some people say to me, you know what, Richard, I think a lot of this is symbolic. Maybe it's an exaggeration, maybe it's symbolic. And I say, you know what? I don't think God's gonna do that to us. I think what God is gonna describe and lay on our hearts has to be something like that we're actually gonna see when we get there for God's word to be true. And he says that, he says that, right, for these words are true and faithful. What you're gonna see and what you're gonna describe is what you're gonna get. And so I don't think there's any symbolism necessarily. I don't think there's any exaggeration. But I think what you're really going to see is what is described. Could John describe that in his fullness? He was probably very overwhelmed. He's probably trying to catch and describe with the language that we have something that's pretty overwhelming and pretty impossible to capture. But I think, my friends, that is actually where we are headed no exaggeration. So what does this place look like? Well, there's lots of things and ways that it's just, I think it's perfectly planned. It's got these very accurate dimensions which are given there. It's perfectly planned. There's lots of cities around the world that are planned. Uh, you look at Brasilia, uh, the, 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 the new capital, as it were, of Brazil in the rainforest. They're perfectly planned in some sense. You look at Abuja in Nigeria, the new capital there. Again, it was a planned city. Uh, in Malaysia, we have Putrajaya, which is a new government city there. Perfectly sort of planned. In the UK, we have Milton Keynes uh, and even new towns like Harlow, which were planned in that way. But what you have here far surpasses any kind of planning that we can do here on earth for any city that we can build. It's that and it's above and it's beyond. It's amazing. I mean, it's 1500 miles long, 1500 miles high and 1500 miles wide with walls that are 200 feet thick. It's a big place, my friends. Far exceeds any city that we currently have on the planet at the moment. Perfectly planned, not gonna need any planning permission either. It's there, the plans are already there in God's mind and God's heart. And that is what will be executed at the end of time. It's beautifully appointed. Some houses, they're beautifully appointed, beautifully done inside. Well, this is also beautifully appointed with incredibly firm foundations. And actually what you see there are layers of precious stones in the foundation of the city. And I read those out to you earlier. And that's incredible. That really speaks back into the Old Testament. The Old Testament priest used to wear an ephod and on there were precious stones. And that ephod was all about how people in the Old Testament would communicate with God. Well, the ideas and the jewels of that communication are built into the foundation of the city. 
And again, this is a place of communication and presence with God. And that is built into the foundation of the city itself. That's really exciting. It's a place full of character. Sometimes we say a house is, is, is full of character or a place is full of character. But here it's a little bit different. It's full of character, but that character is God's character. And how is God's character imprinted on that place? It said that it's great, it's holy, it's glorious twice, it's light, it's clear twice, gold twice, transparent. The city is full of the integrity of God himself. It's going to be an amazing place to be a part of. And then also it's going to be safe and secure. It's going to be a place of God's protection the number 12 is mentioned so many different times through this passage i don't know if you picked that up as we read it through the number 12 always represents good and godly government it represents god's power and authority and divine order and so what you have are 12 angels 12 tribes 12 foundations 12 precious stones 12 pearls 12 fruits 12 months and 12 gates and those gates in verse 25 of chapter 21 those gates are not shut at all by day there will be no night there people will come and go they will feel safe and secure there's very few places that i've been to on this planet where i haven't had to lock my car door or lock the car lock the the door of my house I don't know about you, but when you go to bed, when you go to bed, when I go to bed, I'm locking the front door. I'm checking that everywhere is secure. Well, when we are in heaven, this new heaven, this new earth, this new Jerusalem, we will no longer have to worry in that way. It's a place of safety, security, and God's protection. And so we've talked about the presence of God. We've talked about the place of God. Now let's just look at the people of God. There is a beautiful picture by a Belgian artist of, of the people of God kind of gathering around the throne in this sort of garden city. It's absolutely beautiful. It's something to behold, trying to kind of describe what it is that John is looking at. And what I want to draw your attention to is this fountain down at the front of the picture. That resonates with chapter 21, verse 6, which we just read. Those thirsty can drink from the fountain of the water of life. And we know, as we've read through scripture in the New Testament and even the Old Testament as well, when we talk about water and the fountain of the water of life, oftentimes we mean the Holy Spirit. And so as we look forward to what God has for us, it's almost unlimited access to the Holy Spirit. And, and we kind of know and experience the Holy Spirit in part, this side of heaven, as it were. But there we will know the work and the person of the Holy Spirit in full. I don't know about you, but I am in, I'm looking forward to that. And at the same time, in chapter 22, verse 2, it says the hungry can come and eat of the fruit of the tree of life. And the tree of life often is used to represent Jesus himself. It means that we can partake of Jesus fully all the time. We'll have that perfect relationship. It will be incredible. An amazing experience of the Holy Spirit and of Jesus. That is going to be incredible that is for those who are overcomers those who persevere in life with god who don't turn back so the emphasis here is on remaining with the lord staying strong even through difficult times that's what the whole book of revelation is about it's stay strong stay true to the end whatever that will mean and that is the encouragement to us but then that is also contrasted. You got to the thirsty, the fountain. Praise the Lord, the Holy Spirit. You got to the one who conquers. Keep going. Persevere. 
But at the same time, the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable is the word that's used there. The murderers, the sexually immoral, immoral the sorcerers, the idolaters and all liars. Those who persistently rebel against God and live a life that does not honor him, but glorifies them. Their end is certain and sure as well. They will partake in none of those things. And in a sense, that word detestable there, it means your, your life stinks. <laughs> it's like rubbish to the Lord, which is why I put that picture there behind. And what Revelation does is it brings out these contrasts. Here and now in the world that we live, that mixture, we can't always tell right from wrong, good from evil in terms of people and situations and circumstances. But I tell you, my friends, the days are coming when that will become easier. And when we're in heaven, that distinction will be incredibly clear. At the same time, John goes on to talk about the nations. So he talks about the people who will be there, who won't be there. But then he begins to talk about the nations as well. Somebody once asked me, do you think there'll be cultures, different cultures in heaven? Or will we all be kind of the same? Will God sort of, uh, I, I don't know, make us cultureless in some sense? And I say to them, you know, I really don't think so. God talks in Revelation about nations, tribes, languages, and peoples in Revelation 5, 9, Revelation 7, 9 to 10, Revelation 13, 7, and Revelation 14, 6. At least four times he makes reference to the nations, tribes, languages, and peoples. And here again, in the final vision of the new Jerusalem coming out of the new heaven to the new earth, again, the nations are mentioned. So my friends, I really do think that that heaven will be a multicultural place. So you've got the first reference there, chapter 21, 24. It says the saved nations will walk in the light of the glory of God. The kings of the earth will bring the glory and honor of the nations into the city. Those things which honor God, those things which glorify God from our cultures and from our nations, those are the things that are going to be permitted. And those that don't are going to be kept outside says the same thing again in chapter 21 26 the kings of the earth will bring the glory and honor of the nations into the city the best of our cultures that which honors god that is what we will experience together in the new jerusalem so will there be cultures in heaven my friend absolutely i do believe that they will but they'll be redeemed and purified each one into that mixture. And then the last reference to the nations there in 22 verse 2, it talks about the leaves of the tree of life are for the healing of the nations. We already mentioned that the tree of life may refer to Jesus himself. And actually, one of the things that Jesus accomplished on the cross was not only to give us the opportunity to reconcile with God personally, but also he died in order to reconcile the nations together. The leaves of that tree that represents Jesus are for the healing of the nations. And, you know, one of the things that I'm looking forward to in heaven is the fact that actually the, no, the nations will no longer squabble. There'll be no more for against Brexit. There'll be no more for against different nations, conflicts or wars. Actually, Christ's full work that was accomplished in the cross will be realized in heaven. Another reason, I think, that we can look forward to what God has for us. This city is the perfect place for the nations to dwell together. We often talk at All Nations here about learning to deal with differences together well. Well, in heaven, those differences are going to be resolved once and for all. So what does that mean for us now? We have a community of nations which will be brought together in heaven. But actually what that needs now is a mission to the nations. So we've got a community of nations that's coming, but it necessitates a mission to the nations now. 
It necessitates us engaging in activities whereby people are aware of the choices that they make now have eternal consequences about being in the place and the people and the presence of God or not, as the case may be. So that is the missional emphasis that comes out of this passage. And I just want to finish here in chapter 22. Jesus says, I think these are really helpful words for us to hold on to in this season. Behold, I come quickly. And then in 22, 12, behold, I come quickly. And then the response is, come, Lord Jesus, come. And then he says, surely I come quickly. And then John finishes his book, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, and Put this into place. This is the parousia. This is the second coming of Jesus. And these things will be inaugurated. These things will happen once Jesus has come again. Whew. So I go back to the question that I started with. Where will you be? Not in a week, not in a month, not in a year, but in 500 years time. Because the decisions we make now will have massive implications for what we will experience in eternity. If we've made those decisions for Jesus, if Jesus is the central part of our life, the one around who our life is orchestrated, we're written in the book of life. We will enjoy the new Jerusalem coming from the new heaven to the new earth. We will enjoy being the people of God in the place of God, in the presence of God. But if we don't have that relationship, we won't. We will not enjoy those things. The book of Revelation is very, very clear about that. And so as we look around us now with the difficulty of the pandemic, I'm reading things every day just as you are. The statistics, they're awful. It's awful what is happening in London and the southeast and the east. It's awful because it's spreading and you can see it's happening in the north of the country as well. We're by no means over the worst of it by the look of things. But in the midst of that, I say to you, my friends, keep your eyes up to the horizon. <laughs> there is something marvelous, beautiful, and extraordinary coming into our lives in the future as we have that relationship with God even now. I share this as a word for challenge. If you don't enjoy that relationship with God through Christ, but I also share this as a massive word of encouragement and reassurance. That's what it's been to me as I look at what is happening around me now. So I bless this word into your hearts. Let's just pray as we close. Father, we bless you. Your word is incredible. Lord, you have kindly shown us not only where we need to be now, but where we are going to. And Lord, as we look around us, that picture becomes ever more beautiful as we see the difficulty and the suffering and the pain around us in our situations now. Father, we look forward to that multicultural kingdom experience that we will enjoy as the new Jerusalem comes from the new heaven to the new earth. But also, Lord, we look at the seeds of that we see in our own church and other churches as we enjoy crossing the cultures together as we gather in fellowship, whether that's physically face-to-face -face or whether that's using technology such as Zoom. Lord, continue to gather us together as representatives of your multicultural kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.